episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Today I have with me Skip Butterfield. How's the weather on your side of the mic? Mighty fine. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Well, let's keep exploring. Today's Her Story lesson is about explorer, travel writer, photographer, missionary, and adventurer, Isabella Lucy Bird. You ready, Mr. Butterfield? As ready as I'll ever be. (laughs) Born into an upper-class evangelical Anglican household on October 5th, 1831 in England, you would think that Isabella would have had it made. In some ways she did, but in a lot of ways she did not. As a child, she was plagued with poor health, including headaches, insomnia, depression, and a spinal problem. She had a tumor removed from her spine when she was 19. Oh, poor girl. Yeah. Poor mental health and, in turn, physical health was very common among young women at the time because of the repressively limiting expectations of women. A doctor stated, Among intelligent, high-spirited girls of this period who were thwarted by lack of formal education and oppressed constrictive social conventions. So this is a doctor who is like, yeah, these young women have aspirations, but there's nowhere for them to go, nowhere for their efforts to be led, and so they're just kind of stuck with what's expected, which is get married. This is what the doctor said. Babies. What he's saying made sense, and he's saying that the social convention should be lifted on these women because they're yeah, not getting to the point I, where they should I be. I know. I'm saying like that. The, the doctors are saying this. Like, why is it like? Oh, why is why no one is listening? Like, yeah, I, see. I don't understand. Like, this is like this is these are these are people of science. Like, this yeah. is like factual. Like, this yeah, is, and no one's listening. I'm just yeah. Bird said, I shall always in the future, as in the past, have to contest constitutional depression by earnest work and by trying to lose myself in the interest of others. Her father, Ernest Bird, was a minister in the Church of England, and her mother, Dora Lawson Bird, educated she and her sister, Henrietta, who goes by Henny, at home. I love that. We're going to call her Henny for the rest of the episode. Feels very current, everyone saying Henny. Oh, no. (laughs) After a particularly tough bout with depression, a doctor recommended travel as a solution to her chronic illnesses. Um, can I get that subscription, please? (laughs) (laughs) Cannot be the solution to any problems that I have had. Yes, doctor. Oh, travel? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Got it. (laughs) Taking the doctor's advice, her father gave her a hundred pounds and sent her to visit her cousins in America in 1854. He told her that she could stay there until she ran out of money, which that's the dream. Actually, like not running out of money is the dream, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. What do you think a hundred pounds in 1854 equals today? Um, a thousand dollars. Much more. Closer to ten. Oh, oh. Yeah. so she could choose. Unless eat, the calculation eat. that I like did is super off, but I don't think it is. But yeah, so she was like, she was living pretty, or at least she was able to actually experience her time there without crazy worries. Yeah. During her trip to America, she often wrote home to Henny. A recurring theme of hers throughout her life would be writing to Henny. And upon her return, the letters and articles that she had written were compiled and then released as her first book, The English Woman in America, in 1856. Pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. That's pretty quick. Qu- quick turnaround. Yeah. John Leinhardt said the book was equal parts priggish and insightful. Prejudice wonderfully muted by objective observation. <laughs> Which is such an interesting note on the book i guess so for example she took the mayflower on lake erie from detroit to buffalo on the journey she shared the women's cabin with another white woman two slaves and five freed black women on their second day of travel huge waves were pummeling the boat fear and seasickness were all around her the infant of an extremely ill freed slave was fussing loudly and bird comforted the baby She noticed that the black women seemed to be calmer and fatalistic about the dangers in their current suffering, which that's a very telling. And Leinhardt said that she, quote, struggles rather ludicrously to fit all this into her own ideas about superiority. 
I think you could understand why uh, they're not going to be as freaked out about this boat trip if they're coming from where we know they came from. Yeah, no, it's just unfortunate. I like that she's kind of seeing, like, how people that are not her She's very ob- are um actually observant. living yeah. like she got sent over to another place with money and then put out a book and then she encourages she encounters people who've struggled in a way that she's oh, never seen before yeah. and she's finally getting almost like checked yeah. like it's a re- it's, it's a good rea- it's, it's an important reality and what's interesting check. to That's me good. is in the struggle that she's noticing she's trying to understand why she's noticing she's observing them be calmer in the same situation that she's freaking out in right and she's she's trying to understand why exactly it's so interesting the next year she went to canada and then she toured scotland after her father passed away bird moved to edinburgh with her mother and henny she would make trips to the outer hebrids and she wrote articles for several magazines In a publication titled The Quarterly Review, she wrote about the plight of the crofters. She later used the royalties from her writing to help Scottish crofters to emigrate to the United States. In 1864, Bird expressed some incredible self-awareness when she stated, I feel as if my life were spent in the very ignoble occupation of taking care of myself. And that unless some disturbing influences arise, I am in great danger of becoming perfectly encrusted with selfishness and of living to make life agreeable and its path smooth to myself alone. When her mother passed away in 1868, her frequent travels began again. She and her sister, Henny, couldn't have been more different people. Henny loved to stay at home and was perfectly happy living in the village, and Bird wanted nothing to do with that. The two were incredibly close to one another, though, and her first major outing was to Australia, and as it turns out, she hated it. (laughs) She didn't like the temperature, she didn't like the landscape, she just didn't like anything about it, which, you know, to each their own. So she quickly moved on to Hawaii, understandably. Australia to to Hawaii. Yes. Casual. (laughs) Nice. At the time, they uh, were actually called the Sandwich Islands. While she lived there, she lived with royalty, missionaries, and the native Hawaiians. She climbed an active volcano. Do you want to do that with me? Let's climb an active volcano. I'd like to climb something that's not as high or dangerous (laughs) or active. (laughs) Preferably all three. If not, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take two. (laughs) And actually, while she was there, some of her more extreme back problems were solved when she switched from riding horses side saddle to straddling. Oh. Think about it, though. Like, that makes complete sense. Yeah. But people criticized her a lot for that she was like i don't care this is way more comfortable (laughs) i mean she's hanging with royalty going from us you know going to all Mm -hmm. these countries Mm -hmm. who's gonna tell her what yeah like i'm no i'm not gonna hear anyone are you kidding me (laughs) the details from her trip are chronicled in her book the hawaiian archipelago there we go that's a hard word to say for no reason i know after her time in hawaii she made her way to california And then she took a train east from San Francisco in 1873. California had been connected by rail since 1869, and she was making her way to Truckee in the Sierra Nevada. What is it? Was it with the intercon... With the inter... Which railroad was it? Is it the Intercontinental Railroad? Uh, Oh, okay. I was going to give a shout out to that railroad. uh, Shout out to railroads. Shout out to railroads. (laughs) (laughs) Don't know that. Oh, gosh. Okay. Back to Truckee. Truckee was a makeshift mining town full of drunk prospectors, gamblers, and sex workers. The most wild west thing that you can imagine. It sounds like it's, it. Yeah, that sounds I like I mean, the that's wild where west. we are now. Yeah. Oh. This is when and where we are now. Yeah. After this little adventure, she got back on the train and headed to Denver. Colorado was the newest state in America in 1875. In Denver, she bought a horse and hired a guide. One-eyed mountain man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. Jim Nugent. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Can can you think of a more mountain man name? No. (laughs) The two would explore the Rocky Mountains together. Nugent fell in love with Bird, who denied his advances. He took it in stride and respected her decision. Good man. Unlike 
most men, really, honestly. Uh. In a letter to Henny, she wrote, He is a man any woman might love, but no sane woman would marry. Well, you know, <laughs> she's honest. And he admired her, saying that she was a better cattle driver than a man. Uh, I know. Respect. I love go. him. The will they, won't they between she oh. and Nugent, along with her elegant descriptions in the letters she wrote to Henny, helped make her book A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains a bestseller and classic of the travel and outdoor genre. She planned on making her way to Estes Park in the front range of the Rocky Mountains. While exploring the Rockies in 1873, they climbed Long's Peak, a 14,259-foot-high summit. <laughs> nope. Yep. And then this is, this is um, an excerpt from her book. Scaling, not climbing, is the correct term for the last ascent. It took one hour to accomplish 500 feet pausing for breath every minute or two. The only foothold was in narrow cracks on minute projections on the granite. To get a toe in those cracks or here and there on a scarcely obvious projections while crawling on hands and knees, all the while tortured with thirst and gasping and struggling for breath. This was the climb. But at last the peak was won. A grand, well-defined mountaintop. It is a nearly level acre of boulders with precipitous sides all around. And one we came up being the only accessible one. We placed our names with the date of ascent in a tin within a crevice and descended to the ledge. That's really cool. Oh. That's... Oh, her imagery, her wording is so beautiful. Yeah. Oh my gosh. She was a tiny thing, just under five feet tall, and she also she often traveled alone and unarmed. Wow. At one point, she was engulfed in a snowstorm that completely covered her designated track. She's by herself at this time, and she says, I cannot describe my feelings on this ride, produced by utter loneliness, the silence and numbness of all things, the snow falling quietly without wind, the obliterated mountains, the darkness, the intense cold, and the unusual and appalling aspect of nature. All life was in a shroud, all work and travel suspended. I can't fathom, I can't fathom being in a situation like that. Just alone, lost. But I don't think she was she ever lost. It. No, no. You know what I mean? I think, I think she... When you're about to get deep. Uh -huh. <laughs> she had, she found her way even though she was lost. <laughs> like she just knew in her heart. No, I just think she's she's a she's an explorer, an adventurer, and her whole yeah I'm existence, sure she knew her whole person is yeah. not even just that kind of loss, but it's like kind she of could... when you don't know where you are, but you're kind of okay with not knowing where you are, you know. It was abundantly clear in her writing that the idea of potential danger all around her was important for her to not be in danger to herself. After spending m months in the Rockies, Bird returned to Estes Park when the money started running out. She earned her money cooking and cleaning for the cowboys, and she reportedly enjoyed the labor and truly enjoyed being active. The men didn't feel threatened by her, and she decidedly stated that a prominent characteristic of the frontier was a habit of respectful courtesy to women. Mm. Which isn't actually the, like, reputation the Wild West gets, but it makes sense. Yeah. Less than a year after Bird left Colorado, Nugent was shot dead by cattleman Griffith Evans after an ongoing unsolved feud came to a sudden end. Whoa. I know. So That's sad. sad yeah. So sad. Upon her return to the UK, Bird didn't settle for a passive middle class life. She campaigned on the behalf of slum dwellers. In 1880, Bird's sister Henny died of typhoid, a bacterial infection that leads to fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and obviously death. It is spread through contaminated food and drinking water, and it was prevalent in places where hand washing was less frequent. Wash your hands, people. Please. Wash your hands. Thank you. Okay. A year later, at the age of 50, Bird married Dr. John Bishop in 1881. She found love. She did, but he died five years later. Oh, well, she found, she, she had yeah. it. She had it. She had it. Lost it. No. He was old. That's... It wasn't a sad death. It wasn't like a sudden disease sad death. It okay. was a 
of old age. And expected, sort of. Ish. And after his death, Bird got to traveling even more. So we're not even halfway in terms of her traveling. But we are in the episode, I promise, guys. <laughs> I'm just excited about this one. As she traveled in her 60s, she expressed feeling that her early travels were dilettante. Using some of her inheritance money, she studied medicine and decided to travel as a missionary, bringing more purpose to her travels other than adventure. Because she recognized that she was fortunate in her ability to travel for fun. Um, and now, in, in her older years, felt like it was time to give something back to people. That's nice of her. Yeah. In February of 1889, she took quite an extensive journey. First, India, where she opened two hospitals. One for her sister, the Henrietta Bird Hospital, and the other for her late husband, John Bishop Memorial Hospital. After India, she journeyed to Tibet, the Persian Gulf, and Kurdistan. Bird couldn't travel alone in these countries as she had in the American West. At the very least, she needed an interpreter. She joined up with a group of British soldiers who were traveling between Baghdad and Tehran. She didn't exactly enjoy having to rely on them, as she was a very independent woman, but she knew that it was necessary to ensure her safety in this particular region. She followed the unit's commanding officer during survey work, carrying her revolver and medicine chest supplied by Henry Welcome's company in London. Henry Welcome was a pharmaceutical entrepreneur, and this sounds like corporate sponsorship to me. <laughs> Who wants to sponsor this podcast? Oh. This little, this little, uh... <laughs> oh, hello, Fresh. Where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> she spent time in Kashmir and Ladakh, where maybe five other white Western women had been before. She spent six months traveling through Iran, Kurdistan, and Turkey. After, she traveled to Hong Kong, Canton, Saigon, and Singapore. She spent five weeks in the Malaysian Peninsula, and then she went back to Japan, Korea, and to China's Yangtze River. She has she been has she not been to a place on this um, <laughs> on planet the, on the planet on this planet probably the of North Earth. Pole I think no That's I'm sure it. she's been there I'm sure you know she had to help people out over there you know there's just something it says bird was here yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yep she said this of her travels in the far east it is pleasant to me among people whose faces are not soured by the east wind or wrinkled by the worrying effect of keeping up appearances who have no formal visiting but real sociability who regard the light manual labor of domestic life as a pleasure not a thing to be ashamed of this goes to show the evolution of her mind and writing from her first travels and ideas of the world um she was known to be critical of the indigenous women that she encountered in her early travels, but in the end found relief in exploring new cultures and experiences. And I think that goes to show um, just shelter, how much traveling can do to your mind. mind. Just, you can just expand, to your, yeah, you, know, you know, connect with people that you might normally not have exactly. the capability and to. And of course, not everyone's going to have the financial resources to travel the way that she did, but there's ways to do it even within our own country of just getting out of your one part of the country yeah, and just life, experience yeah. even neighborhoods that, you know, just areas of town culture traveling is so good culture shock is a necessity oh, it's so tough no one can travel right now but don't neglect yourself of the world just yeah. because you feel comfortable in one place exactly and you're gonna miss out on everything mm -hmm. and with the times now mm -hmm. you will not get that chance exactly isabella bird became the first woman along with a small group of other women inducted into the royal geographic society in 1892 Big fat shocker, though, that not everyone was on board with this. Lord Curzon, the not-yet-Viceroy of India, sent a letter to the Times on May 30th, 1893. He's a big old butt nugget. Okay, he says, quote, 
we contest into the general capability of women to contribute scientific geographic knowledge. What? Their sex and training render them equally unfitted for exploration, and the general professional female globetrotters with which America has lately familiarized us is one of the horrors of the later end of the 19th century. Uh, what? What is he? And this is like after is she's already done about? this trip. Uh, what is he talking about? What yeah. is he talking about? What is he talking about? That is, he's spewing <sighs> verbal nonsense. Oh my god, flames on the side of my face. <laughs> it was decided that after the initial 15 women who were inducted as members, uh, that they wouldn't be expelled, but no more would be elected. Oh. Yeah, and then she says, in response to this, The fellowship as it stands at present is not worth making any trouble about. At the same time, the proposed act is dastardly injustice to women. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, you're not even worth it. I don't even want to be part of your stupid don't, club. Don't want to sit but here. But also, how dare you? <laughs> stupid. Somewhere along the way, Bird had gotten a camera and began photographing her travels for her books and articles. She was inducted into the Royal Photography Society in 1897, and her last trip was to Morocco. In 1904. She died just shy of her 73rd birthday on October 7th, 1904. And rumor has it that she was planning another journey through China at the time. They Ugh. say that she even, like, had, like, her travel documents and, like, an itinerary wow. and, like, stuff ready to go for it. Wow. Yeah, she's, like, she's, like, seven, you know, she 73 and she's, down. like, no, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. She wasn't slowing down <laughs> anytime soon. That's unfortunate then. Her mm -hmm. death was, I mean, no, you know, it's untimely. Yeah. Sad. A publication called The Spectator said, There never was anybody who had adventures as well as Miss Bird. Carol Churchill, a playwright, used Bird as a character in her play Top Girls. A lot of the dialogue written by Churchill was from Bird's writings. I don't know this play, but I'm about to get it and read it because I gotta know. Yeah, please. Yeah. Let me know. That's really cool. Yeah. Her, the character to base that, you Oh, know. yeah, especially with how beautiful yeah. her letters and writing already is. Like, you really don't have to do much to it. You could just, like, turn it all into dialogue. Yeah. Her beautiful writing filled many books. And if you would like to read more about her adventures, here's a list. Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. And it's funny, her publisher, John Murray, tried to get her to tone down her descriptions that were, quote, unsuitable topics for a lady to write about or for ladies to read about. And she was like, no, this happened. I'm going to talk this about This was it. my, yeah, she's like, uh, there were other women there too. What do you mean it's not suitable? <laughs> um, the Golden Charities and the Way Thither, uh, that's her book uh, chronicling her travels through Japan, Indonesia, and the Middle East. She has journeys in Persia and Kurdistan, among the Tibetans, Korea and her neighbors, the Yangtze Valley and beyond, Chinese pictures, and notes on Morocco. She's got a whole bunch in this outdoor adventure genre. I'll conclude with this excerpt from a letter she wrote to Henny. She said, I have freedom and you know how I love that. I am so thankful for my capacity for being interested. What would my lonely life be without it? Kind of sounds like a uh, Carmen San Diego in terms of oh, like just kind of hopping bit. around. Where in the world like, is she? Is a little bit of a Carmen San Diego. You know, just uh, encountering these these different cultures and mm -hmm. and writing kind of so much. I think it's so important learning. for like good travel writers and like the outdoor genre, whatever. Like her she has such an ability to paint a picture and make you feel like you're there. And I think yeah. that's what's important with, so we were talking earlier saying, like, travel, travel, travel. But if you can't travel, pick up a book, a, a, a travel book, a novel about this place, this person's adventure through it, their experiences. Even someone like her, she's a, a white woman. I feel like I, I can't obviously identify with like her upbringing, but in terms of uh, like I can identify with my general perspective and being able to be like, this was her experience. General perspective. He just saluted when I said general perspective. But I think, I think it's important to find books written by people that you can 
hop into their shoes and you can quickly identify with where they're coming from and where they're going. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think it's just important for people to be able to at, at least identify other people's perspectives if they can't, you know, physically can't be brought there to that destination. Mm-hmm. Just to be aware of other people's, exist, you know, uh, yeah. upbringings and, you know, uh, you know. Way of life. Yeah, it's makes sense i mean yeah i mean specifically like she is i mean she she's someone who has been everywhere i don't believe she went to south america but um i don't know that that was really a a a major destination during that time for europeans i'm not sure maybe it's not quite wasn't as easily accessible which would make sense if they couldn't really get down there right as easily but she was doing all this. but she was so all over the world i mean i guess if she got to australia she could get to south america and but she anyway was doing this in the late 1800s early 1900s yeah it's 2020 now and some people are still just you know refusing I don't know. To explore, refusing but we're, to listen. But we're, we're, we want to change that. You, I'll change that and, you, you know. Yeah. We, we love travel. <laughs> um, she was... We do. I, I, I hope... I, I, you got to uh, read that play and let me know. Yeah, Top Girls. I'm really excited to look into that. I'm going to try to find it. I wish the drama bookstore was still open. I wish any stores were open, but here we are. Be safe. I hope by the time this airs that this won't be a relevant banter and I'll have to edit it out. That would be amazing. Be safe still. I don't still. think. Yeah. Oh, be super safe. Wash your hands. We're not at that part yet, though. But yeah, wash your hands because like... Preemptive. Yeah. Thank you all so much for listening. It really does mean the world to us. Please rate and review the podcast. It's silly, but it helps. Give us a follow on Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast. And you can also send us an email at Women of Her Story Podcast at gmail.com. Tune in this Friday for an interview with comedian Ashley Lyston. She is absolutely hilarious. I know you guys will have a great time listening to it. So make sure you don't miss that one. I'm going to listen in. Yeah. Well, you better. Yeah. <laughs> you